Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Men in Cars, the podcast where we talk about the history of motorsport with or without men. I hope you guys are all well. Hope you've had a good week. I am running a bit behind. I'm not going to lie with this week's episode, guys. I'm just leaving it to last minute because I'm so crazy. Um, But it is currently quite early in the morning, so... I apologise if I am a bit, I wouldn't say I'm tired, I am obviously raring to go for for Men in Cars pod, but I also couldn't make a coffee this morning because I ran out of milk, so, but I've got some tea, so it's fine. Anyway, so this week, of course, it is a women's week, and I wanted to talk about one of the, one of the most important figures in kind of like women's motorsport history that isn't really talked about a whole bunch so like a fortnight ago when i did the episode on michelle mouton obviously she's like a highly celebrated female racer or just like racer in general so there's a lot of kind of coverage of her achievements as i talked about and even when you just think of like group b rallying that era in general you would think of her whereas with k peter who i'm doing this week's episode on there is like significantly less coverage not just of her but of like those women who raced in the 1930s like specifically so it was a bit hard kind of like researching it I imagine I mean I covered her a little bit I did a a project at university on women in motorsport so I kind of I guess you could say discovered her like researched her a bit then but you know in that context I had to cover like quite a lot of information in relatively few words so I couldn't go into as much detail and I wanted to kind of you know go into achievements a bit more so this week will be a bit of a shorter episode I think like the one that I did on Roberta Cowell when you get to figures kind of the further back you go there's you know not much information available about them just due to the fact that motorsport was not particularly kind of sensationalised in in the way it is today or the way it was, you know, in the 80s onwards or something like that. So it'll be a little bit shorter, but think of these just like a little, um, a mini episode, a fun-sized episode. But I still wanted to like cover individual figures, like have their own episodes, because I think... Again, it is like really important to highlight their achievements or them as individuals rather than just like a, a group collective. So even though there might be only like three websites talking about them, no books also. When I was researching my, my uni project, there was one written book on women in motorsport, just one. I think there was maybe one other one, maybe a couple that were like autobiographies. But apart from that, people are not researching this like at all, apart from me. But even then, kind of like navigating archives, I use mostly like archives from Motorsport Magazine just because I have them accessible. And they've covered motorsport since like the 1920s. So it's, you know, a good resource. But as you can imagine, the way they talk about women is not particularly detailed or I don't know I couldn't judge whether it was particularly accurate or not but if I had to take a wild guess I would think you know sometimes not and you know often focusing on the wrong things I find or their language that they use is not very progressive but what did I expect also I keep repeatedly running into this problem I don't know if this is specifically like a motorsport or what if you do like more niche topics but why do people keep publishing like drastically different information who are their sources where are they getting this from something happened in a year either happened in that year or it happened in another year like there's surely no it's not like an opinion like tell me what year these races were it shouldn't be that hard so who knows where i get my information from i do put the sources in the thing though so you can see if something's wrong it's low-key not my fault right so let's get into this episode so as i said before this is on k peter who was one of the most prominent figures in brooklands during the 1930s 
And whilst there were kind of like a few other women racing around that time on similar tracks, she was probably the most kind of sensationalized, the most kind of noted female driver. So she was commented on a fair bit in media and within those motorsport circles, she was very well known. Now, if you remember, if you go back all nine episodes ago, I talked about her a bit in my first episode about Brooklands. I did also realise fairly recently that I pronounced her name wrong because I assumed her name is spelt or her surname, Peter, is spelt P-E-T-R-E. So I thought, oh, she's Canadian. It's probably like French Canadian, but it's not. It's her English husband's name and it's just pronounced Peter. But, you know, which I suppose makes it easier. I was planning on maybe intentionally mispronouncing it a bit because I can't pronounce my R's very well in French, so, well. Anyway, so she was born in Canada in 1903 and kind of grew up there and lived there until she was 27. So so she learned to drive kind of at relatively early age, I think, could do the maths, like 17, I guess that's quite normal, but... So she learned to drive then much probably like her peers, but not competitively at that point. She was really involved in kind of lots of sports and was really talented at those kind of most notably I think ice skating was her favorite but again motorsport not really on her radar you know at that time cars were were such a new kind of concept I think kind of racing them was not really a thing particularly for kind of like young women So in 1930s she then moved to England after she married her husband Henry Peter and that was in 1928 so even though she did move to England when she was literally like 27 most people kind of like refer to her as an English driver. So it was after she kind of married Henry and moved to England when she really picked up the kind of like bug for motorsport you could say so her husband was actually an an aviator at Brooklyn so I again talked about this a little bit in my episode on Brooklands, but it was also used as like, you know, an aviation site. So it makes a lot of sense that if her husband was there, she would have seen those kind of early beginnings of what Brooklands would become in terms of a real like hub for motorsport. So she started driving competitively, or I suppose racing in 1932 in a kind of black low chassis, four and a half litre Invicta. So this was very much like a beginner's car I think she didn't really like gel with it that much it was a bit clunky she didn't really like the way that the gears shifted and although despite these kind of like defects in the car it was really obvious that she had a real talent for racing or a real passion for it so after she kind of practiced raced a bit in this car her husband then brought her a red Daytona Wosley Hornet special and this was a much more sophisticated car and she did extremely well in it she came third and second in her first two races in the interclub novices handicap and that was at brooklands so she continued to race in that car for you know the majority of the season although she also really liked to kind of borrow and kind of like experiment with with other cars so And this was actually one of the things she did that was kind of like most commented or what she's most known for so in order to kind of like get access to better cars or or even like driving advice she would you know flirt with men kind of use her personality her appearance to kind of like further her motoring career and this arguably did work very well because I think part of what made her so kind of like memorable was she was extremely short she was only like four foot ten I think and and had a really kind of like people described her as having like a fiery personality so that and also her the way she presented herself like her clothing was also commented on so she was known for dressing very kind of immaculately in tailored blue silk overalls that often matched her racing cars so she did later describe that she would use her kind of more polished appearance to exert her authority she described so I suppose gaining credibility, making people kind of take notice of her through her kind of yeah physical appearance and personality, which is, you know, an aspect that other drivers probably couldn't take advantage of. So by 1933, she started driving her two litre Bugatti, which was the car that she was kind of most known for driving. I think 
in most kind of mentions of her, you know, it talks about K. Peter and her Bugatti. So this started the kind of period where she had like most of her success, I'd say. So she came second in a women's mountain handicap at Brooklands, which was very impressive because this was kind of more difficult than the original track of Brooklyn. So at Brooklyn's, they've, you've got the original circuit and then you've got various kind of variations of that, which are obviously used for different types of races, really. So, And she didn't kind of just have success at Brooklyn. She also finished her first international rally where she was navigating for Joan Richmond in the RAC rally. And, and I know by like today's standards, that maybe sounds a bit low, but I think at the time for women to be able to compete or be able to enter those races, be able to finish them is very impressive in itself. So by 1934, she had her first win at Brooklands and this was in the fourth Walton Scratch Sprint. And this was, you know, fairly quickly followed by a series of other wins, which really kind of catapulted her as immediate sensation at that time. And I think 1934 and 1935 really mark what she is perhaps best known for which is kind of a long series of like record attempts so the most notable kind of a record attempt that k peter had was her battle for the ladies outer circuit record and this was a really like long and like arduous yeah battle with with gwenda stewart so it was like k peter would put in a time and then gwenda stewart would do a time that would be better and so this back and forth that went on for quite a while and was quite arduous i think eventually gwenda stewart did get the fastest time but k peter did go on to you know set her own records and that she did in the chelsea walsh hill climb in 1935 so you know she she did all right now a race during this time that is particularly like commented on in various kind of articles or like resources about her was in 1934, there was a, a relay race, which was the the Light Car Club uh, relay race. And Kay Peter was competing in an all-women's team. And this was one of the kind of early races where there was like quite a bit of controversy, a bit of kind of game playing, kind of tactics kind of stuff, which is quite reminiscent of what motorsport can be like nowadays. So so Peter was in the, the Singer team and they had a kind of rivalry with the MG team. I won't go into all the details because it's quite like complicated, but Singer were essentially trying to, you know, impede MG's race and they actually managed to intercept their pit signals, which worked initially. But, you know, the, during the race, there were kind of various accidents and by the end, MG found kind of like rural loopholes, which meant that singer ended up finishing fifth so i think it's still a good a good result it was they were still kind of hailed for their achievements but but yeah that kind of just sticks out to me as something that was kind of like quite unusual so by 1935 peter was driving a kind of much older ex lsr delage which he actually had to have a special seat installed and also pedal extenders so much like today cars were not or race cars were not particularly well catered for women but there we go and she also found this quite kind of like a difficult car to drive but she still had a, a comparatively kind of very successful season so this is particularly kind of notable because at the time at brooklyn's parts of the track are kind of banked so they kind of raise up i can't describe it but it's like like a skate track kind of so the cars kind of you know go on their side which obviously gives a much bigger advantage to like smaller cars because if you have a big car you're not going to be able to go like well, they wouldn't have the power to be able to race you know on their side nearly so particularly considering at those times the the size or the types of cars ranged hugely it's not like now whether the cars are you know the same type of car they were they really varied in their kind of shape and size and obviously speed so to put out the the results that she did or still have success was incredibly impressive for this time. Now, big record time. She also won a mixed mountain race and she was actually the first woman to beat any of the men that she raced against. So she continued, you know, entering various races in 1936, but this was kind of quite an up and down season. Nothing kind of sticks out particularly. It was, you know, results were varying and yeah, fairly uncomplicated, but not kind of spectacular. It's also worth noting that in 1934, 1935 and 1937, she actually competed in Le Mans. So 
Her best place, I think her team finished 13th in 1934. That also, you know, adds another... What's it, another bow to your string? I don't know what the saying is. But considering she kind of did track races, she did rallying, navigation, rallying, and also endurance racing. She really had that kind of adaptability in terms of in terms of motor racing. So by 1937, we really see a fairly swift end or decline in her career. So in 1937, at a practice for the Brooklyn's 500 miles race, a driver called Reg Parnell kind of stalled on the banking and rolled over and ended up crushing a couple of cars, but most significantly Peter's car. So... She was yet yeah, crushed under his car and had quite severe head injuries and was actually in a coma for quite a few days. But quite miraculously, she survived. So she did end up racing again in kind of later years. So in 1938, her first race back after her incident, she tried to enter the race, which was at Crystal Palace, but she kind of lost her nerve, you know, wasn't really kind of ready to, to go back. But she did actually end up winning the chelsea walsh climb in 1938 so she still did have some success i think she also then went a bit more towards rallying but kind of as a navigator so despite her kind of injuries i think she was left kind of half paralyzed from her accident so that did obviously hinder her her skills as a driver but she still tried to you know be in the world of motorsport as much as she could now while she could have you know carried on this a bit more she unfortunately had another accident but this time as a spectator after a car that was racing at brooklands crashed into yeah spectators and injured her and some of her other colleagues so she suffered kind of more head injuries and but also survived so it was after that that she really went on to pursue a career as a motoring journalist rather than a driver i think you know, those two accidents obviously did, again, hinder her sporting ability. Now, she's quite unlucky, admittedly, in these few years, because in 1939, guess what, she had another accident. So she was involved in quite a very severe car crash. So she was driving with Reggie Empsom, and I think a lorry crashed into them, or I can't quite remember exactly, but they had an accident with a lorry, and... Reggie Empson was killed instantly, but she suffered more head injuries, more facial injuries, but also survived. So this was quite, you know, took quite a toll, I think, this being the third accident in, was it like three years? That's quite significant. And also Empson's wife was, I believe, suing Peter. So she ended up having to pay over £4,000 in damages to their family after you know straight after the accident she was charged with manslaughter but this was you know she just ended up paying the the damages instead so after that she was like a staff writer for the sketch which was a, a journalism company and during the war she actually ended up focusing more on kind of like cookery so she worked at the ministry of food and did work for them which counted you know as her contribution to the war effort so for the rest of her working career after the war, she was employed by Austin's kind of design team. So she was really involved in like selecting colours for their various models. And this included the, the mini. So lots of people note that she often chose that kind of baby blue colour that her race suit was often made out of. So she worked there for a while, but she ended up retiring entirely during her mid 50s. So she had a lot of kind of complications from her various accidents because I believe in all three of them, she, you know, suffered quite significant head injuries. So she would have a lot of headaches and kind of memory loss and things like that. So, so in 1962, unfortunately, her husband passed away. So she never remarried and continued to live in London for the rest of her life, even though she kind of went back to Canada, I believe, for a, for a brief period of time. But yeah, for the, for the rest of her life, she was very private, but she maintained her kind of interest in motoring and, you know, still attended race meetings and things like that. So in 1994, she passed away at the age of 91. And like kind of lots of figures from this time, you know, she really kept to herself and 
was not kind of a big celebrity, but after she died, lots of people did really make a note of her her achievements in motorsports. So, you know, obituaries written, kind of really detailing all her achievements. And she was also mentioned in the Montreal Hall of Fame. So although, yeah, she didn't kind of have as big of a, a role in motorsport, obviously, as she got older, but it's really good to see that when she did pass away, people really remembered what, what a talent she was or what an impact she made in the world of motorsport, you know, in the, in the 1930s. So that is all I have on Kay Peter. I will try and find some clips of her racing. I think there should be some. Also, I apologise for last week. I tried to post the clip on TikTok, but um, TikTok kept taking it down. They didn't like it. They thought it was inappropriate. Don't know why. So that's annoying, but it is on Instagram Reels. But I hope this week's one will not get banned. Anyway, if you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow on Spotify, five star rating, also on Apple Podcasts. If you want to kind of like, like, subscribe, all that stuff on YouTube, and also follow on TikTok and Instagram. It is just Men in Cars Pod, and you can find kind of little clips and some photos to kind of go with the episode. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening, and I will see you next week where we are doing a episode that is just on one specific Grand Prix. have to guess which one it is. I'm joking, you don't have to. But it should be a good one. I'm looking forward to doing kind of like a much, like a really... This is basically one weekend. I suppose it spans, it's a deeper than that. But yes, we will see how that goes. Anyway, again, thanks for listening and see you soon. Bye!